page 68. If you happen to have a copy of it, this is maybe uh, one of the most famous teachings in the entire book, page 68. <clears throat> we are up to chapter four, Mishnah number 28. This is arguably the most famous Mishnah in the entire book. Rabbi Alazar Hakapar Omer. Rabbi Alazar Hakapar says, Hakina Vehataiva Vehakavod. Envy, jealousy, taiva, which means lust, and kavo, which means honor or pursuit of honor. Motsian esa adam mina olam. They remove a person from the world. There's three things that are so harmful that if someone falls into the trap of envy, of lust, and of honor, these three things will extract a person from the world. Now, it's important to note that that particular formula, namely a person is extracted from the world, actually appears earlier in chapter two of this book, we studied it a couple of years ago, where it talks about the evil eye and the evil heart or the evil inclination and hatred of humanity remove a person from the world. So it's interesting that there are two Mishnayos that seem to parallel each other that are both describing three things that are so harmful, so destructive, that a person gets removed from the world because of those three things. So we have to see what the connection is between this Mishnah and that Mishnah. Now, Rabbi Elazar Hakapar is not mentioned very often in the literature. What we do know about him is that he was a colleague of Rabbi Judah the Prince. And there are a few teachings that he brings in the Talmud and in the Midrash and the various other literature. And it does seem that his teachings, they do dovetail with this mission that we have of his in, in Pirkei Avos. So for example, there's a statement and that's brought down in, in the Midrash that Rabbi Alazar HaKapar is talking about the various parts of a home and of a door and which part of it a person should try to emulate. Don't be like the upper lintel. It's so high you can't ever reach it. And don't be like the bars, the beams of the home. And don't be like the middle bars. Rather, you should be like the threshold. You should be like the lowest part. Because even after an entire building gets destroyed, you know what doesn't get destroyed? The threshold of the house. That remains in place. And the commentators explain the threshold, that's the thing that everyone tramples over. That's the thing that everyone stamps. That's what everyone steps upon when they walk into the house. And what he's teaching us is this idea of humility. Similar to this principle, don't try to pursue honor. Because if you pursue honor, it's going to have the negative effect and it's going to remove you from the world. On the flip side, what if you pursue humility and you strive to be the lowest thing, let everyone trample over you? Then you will endure. Even after everything else is destroyed, all the things that are towering above everything are, are destroyed. The, the ceiling is destroyed. The lintels, are, everything's destroyed. You know what still remains in place? The thing that's on the bottom. Via the people stamping upon it, it got stronger and stronger and it became uh, anti-fragile and it endured over the years of it being of it being strengthened via adversity. And here it's not surprising that this same author would tell us or would be the one to advise us to try to shun honor and instead try to be more humble. Now there's another teaching in the Talmud and in the Midrash uh, from Rabbi Elazar Kapur. It's a really a somewhat of a, a head scratcher. It's talking about the Nazir. Who is the Nazir? The Nazir is someone who accepts upon him or herself a vow to become a Nazir, which means to refrain from drinking wine and really any grape derivative, and from cutting their hair 
and from coming into contact with dead people, typically for 30 days. That's the Nazir. They become like, a, like an ascetic. They remove themselves from everyone else and they live on this spiritually elevated state for around a month. Now, after that period is concluded, the law states that he brings a sacrifice. What sacrifice does he bring? A sin offering. And the question is, if someone wants to become very holy, and if someone wants to become an ascetic, and if someone wants to refrain from wine and alcohol, and they want to live an elevated life, why are they considered a sinner? Why do they bring a sin offering? Says Rabbi Elazar HaKapar, because you caused yourself undue, unnecessary pain. The Almighty created wine for you to enjoy. And you refrain from it, you abstain from it. That makes you, to a certain extent, a little bit of a sinner. And concludes the Talmud. And if a person only refrains from wine, they're already considered a sinner. How much more of a sinner is someone who refrains from all kinds of worldly pleasures? Now, the reason why this is a head scratcher is because in our Mishnah, Rabbi Elazar Akapra is the one who's telling us that we should not pursue a life of lust. We should not pursue a life of pursuit of physical pleasures, of physical indulgences. Yet this same author in the Talmud tells us that the Nazir who refrains from physical pleasures, you would think that, that would be something that he really loves. Yet he describes him as a sinner. So clearly there is a difference between lust for physical pleasures and asceticism and monasticism. There's this happy medium in between where someone could enjoy life. So, so, someone could say, hey, the Almighty gave all these things for me to enjoy, but to not make that the dominating focus of their lives, to not make it the thing that they are living for. It could be the accoutrements of life. It could be the accompaniment of a good life. The Almighty says, hey, I want you to focus on spirituality. That is your ultimate objective. But let's sweeten things a little bit with physical pleasures as well, provided they don't become the dominating force of, of your life. So those are some of the teachings that we find of his in the scripture, in, in the literature. And it does seem like they do fit into this persona as portrayed in our Mishnah. Now, one more interesting tidbit about this particular sage. We know that there are many sages that lived all over the land of Israel. And today, there is a, a burgeoning scene of archaeology in Israel. So much history in the land. So many great sages that have lived there, so much richness in antiquity in this land, and they're discovering a tremendous amount of physical remains of the previous cultures and societies and peoples that have lived there. And there's uh, there's a lot, by the way, of archaeology in the land of Israel. They did discover the entrance of the lecture hall of the academy of Rabbi Elazar Hakapar. They found a very ornate door, like a, like, like a gate, decorated with all kinds of birds, and it has an inscription in it, Ze Beis Midrasho Shel Ha Shel Rabbi Elazar Hakapar. This is the base medrash. This is the study hall of Rabbi Elazar HaKapper. Apparently, it's the only archaeological finding from that era, from the era about 2,000 years ago, the era of the Mishnah, that has the precise words, Beit Midrash, the words that we still use today, study hall. And it's interesting that this is the particular Tana, the particular author of the Mishnah, who we did discover that particular formulation 
and we still have it today, and it's still available. You could go to the northern part of Israel, and you could see it in a, in, in a museum. Okay, so he's telling us that there's three sins or three pursuits that remove a person from the world. Envy, lust, and honor. Now, the commentaries are quick to point out that in each one of these three things, there's a good version. There's a good kind of envy. There's a good kind of lust. There's a good kind of honor. So, for example, if I'm envious of someone else's good character, if I'm envious of someone else's good deeds, if I'm envy of someone else's spirituality, that is a good kind of envy. If it's going to spur you to try to improve yourself, fabulous. That's a good thing. That is the kind of envy that we can embrace. There's a good kind of lust as well. So, for example, say just talked about the, the lust that exists between a husband and wife. That is a kosher lust. That's why it was created. And by the way, I'll point this out. According to the Kabbalists and according to the uh, literature that talks about these stuff, the more lust that exists between a husband and wife, that is going to affect the kind of soul that they are able to access, that they are able to access. And the more love and desire that exists between a couple, the higher, so to speak, a level of soul that they can access for their progeny. A really interesting and maybe even a little scary idea. But it's a good kind of lust. And I would also add that if someone could kind of marry lust for good things, that is actually a very adroit way of advancing spiritually. So I'll give you guys an example. My son is living me while my son Yoshua, he has two kids in this class. They love studying Torah together. So they're learning Mishnah. So when they finished the Mishnah of the book of Sanhedrin, I said, okay, I'm making a big party. We're going to buy pizza. We're going to buy French fries. And we have a huge party to celebrate that you finished this book of, of, of Talmud. So if you were to, of Mishnah, I'm sorry, of Mishnah. So a few weeks ago, they finished Sanhedrin, and we made a big party, and now they moved on to the next book. And this is the book of Makros. And over Shabbos, my son Yoshua told me, Abba, we finished the book of Makros. I said, amazing. Now we're not going for pizza. We're going for steak. I'm going to buy big steaks. We're going to grill them. We're going to have a great time together. So is lust for steak, is that a good thing? Well, here we're told it's a terrible thing. It removes you from the world. But suppose you could kind of spiritualify it by making it something which is going to contribute towards more spiritual, more Torah, more good deeds. And that's the way you've kind of, you've broken the system, so to speak, and that's a good kind of lust. Very interesting insight. And the commentaries also add that when the honor is designated towards a good thing, that could be a good kind of honor as well. So for example, if someone represents Torah, the Talmud tells us that a Torah sage has to look perfectly handsome and perfectly well-dressed, and there could be no holes in their garments. They can't walk around with dirty, dirty clothing, like a shlamazel, as they say in Yiddish. You have to look neat, you gotta look the part. We know in the yeshivas, the yeshivas of yore, the yeshiva students were dressed like, like, like they were out of the pages of Neiman Marcus and GQ. They would have long, like well coiffed hair and they would wear their hats, their fedoras at a perfect angle and their suits were, were well tailored. They looked like, like male models. And these are yeshiva students. And that's a good thing, because if you're a representative of Torah, you have to have a dignified, noble presentation of yourself, because you're representing Torah. So is that honor? Yes. But 
insofar as the honor is there to portray the honor of Torah, that's a good kind of honor that is to be encouraged. So we have these three terrible things that remove a person from the world, but there's a good version of it, there's a kosher version of it in, in various different ways. Now, what does it mean to be removed from the world? It's not so clear what world we're even talking about. We, of course, believe that there's this world. But there's a very central principle in Jewish philosophy called the next world, the upcoming world, poorly translated as the afterlife. So is it talking about being removed from this world? Or is it being removed from the next world? Or is it from both? Or is it some other world? So the commentaries offer various answers. I would say that the consensus is, or the simple interpretation is that when someone has envy, lust, and honor, their life over here in this world is unlivable. When someone is consumed with envy, they're so envious, they're so jealous of what the other person is, and they're so lustful, they're so desirous, and they're just driven by pursuit of honor. They want people to laud them and to praise them. And when then we see someone else being honored, they just just rankles them. That eats away at you. That makes your life over here unlivable. When someone has envy, they're living a life of sadness because they're always lacking. They have anxiety. That's destructive. Their, their emotional life, their physical life, their equilibrium is unbalanced. Of course, when someone has lust, and it could be lust for all kinds of physical pleasures, you know, they can over people who overeat so much sugar food. Oh my gosh, they stuff their face. It used to be that there wasn't enough calories to go around. Now, really, for the first time in history, there's so much abundance. The problem is that people don't have self control. And they just want to eat and eat and eat. And it's, a, it's, it's an epidemic. It really is. The people in, in advanced, shall we say, developed countries, this is a real issue. People are not healthy because they have too much. And of course, honor, that is something that could be very dangerous. Commentaries quote the Talmud. The Talmud says that, the Talmud notes that Joseph died much younger than the rest of his brothers. And the question that the Talmud asks is, why, why did Joseph live such a shorter life than his brothers? Says the Talmud, because he was a king. And honor shortens your life. I would say, you know, we're a couple of days away from the U.S. election. If you look at pictures of presidents on their inauguration day, and then the last day in office, they age a lot. It's almost like you're the most honorable person on the planet, but that does something, you know, it kind of accelerates your process of aging. It doesn't make you long for this world. So that's, I would say, the most easy interpretation of this Mishnah. These things make your life here worse and shorter, less pleasant and less balanced. Now, some of the commentaries point out that there's a list of people who lose their portion in the afterlife. They lose a portion of Omaba. And the commentaries note that these particular characteristics, envy, lust, honor, are things that have contributed to people just being booted from the afterlife. So for example, Korach. Korach, of course, we mean in the book of Numbers, in the Torah. Moshe's first cousin, Moshe and Aaron's first cousin. And he is, he, he, and he is envious of Aaron's appointment to be the high priest. And he wants to be the high priest. And this envy just consumes him until him and his family get totally destroyed. And they're essentially gone for all of history, for all of eternity. And it's interesting that Aaron, the person that he wants to unseat, to usurp 
his position, Aaron is the one person that is described as having no scintilla of envy. Aaron is the only person described in Jewish literature as not having any shred of envy. He was so, so incredibly happy in his heart that Moses, his younger brother, was made the king of the Jews. And his first cousin, who is just, again, driven by envy, wants to take that role, that position. And the result of that is they get swallowed up, him and his family and all his, all his eternity, so to speak, all his descendants get eaten up by this sinkhole. We see how envy contributes to someone being removed from this world, from the spiritual world. Commentaries bring the story of Gehazi. Gehazi is the right-hand man of Elisha, and he was lustful for money, the money of Naaman. And as a result of that, he was cursed by Elisha, and he was enumerated amongst the people that don't have a portion of Maba. For all of eternity, Gehazi was removed from the world because of his lust for money. And finally, Yeravam, or Jeroboam, the king, so to speak, of Israel, not of Judah, after the split, after um, King Solomon dies, his son Rehavam displays poor leadership, shall we say, and a de different gentleman who na whose name is Yeravam, so Rehavam and Yeravam, there's a little bit of a civil war, and the northern kingdom of Israel secedes from the southern kingdom of Judah. And then they kind of exist concurrently as different nations, as different kingdoms. And Yeravam, he forbade the Jews of his kingdom to travel to the temple. And the reason why is because he was worried what is going to be if the nation goes back to the pilgrimage and they see the temple and they have such feelings of nostalgia and they want to go back to reunite as a nation. And therefore, he would lose his throne. So because of his honor, he lost everything. And he too is counted amongst people that have no portion in Omaba. So these three things are so destructive to make your life over here unlivable. It made your life over there non-existent. And some of the commentaries point out that the reason why it doesn't identify which world these three things are bouncing you out of, it's because it's really both. Envy, lust, pursuit of honor are so destructive, they remove you from this world and from the next. There's a very interesting comment in Rashi. Rashi says, I'm not going to get too into this, but it's interesting just just the general idea. Rashi says, if you study the story of Adam and Eve in their world, in their garden, the three factors that contributed Adam and Eve being booted out of the garden, envy, lust, and honor. Now there's an amazing Rambam in his comment to this Mishnah. He introduces another way to look at this teaching. Again, very short teaching, but really pregnant with a lot of meaning. Envy, lust, and honor remove a person from the world. Says the Rambo, which world do these three things remove a person from? Says the Rambo, from the world of Amuna, the world of faith. Seemingly, the Ramam is understanding Amuna as not an isolated principle, an isolated belief, but an entire world, an entire world view, an entire Weltanschauung, as we say in German. We tend to think of Amuna, faith, as being something, hey, we believe in God and not the alternative. We believe in Torah. It's real, it's not fake. 
we believe that the Almighty oversees what happens to us in this world, and he has a connection with us on an individual, personal level. We believe in reward and punishment. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in Messiah. A lot of things we believe in, but they're kind of ideas that we believe in. The Ramam here is describing to us a different world of Amuna. It's a world that's different than our world. In our world, we view our identity as a body. That's who we are. In the world of Amuna, we're not a body. We're a soul. And that soul has a deep, intimate connection with God. And that soul is actually similar to God. Moreover, the world of Amuna teaches that our soul originates from the highest, most lofty place in existence. Again, in, in Kabbalistic shorthand, we're told that our soul is hewn from God's throne, so to speak. What that means, I don't know. But it's definitely intimating that the origin of our soul is from a very, very holy place. Moreover, we believe that our soul is trapped in this world and it's trying to get back home. Of course, that's the world that we call Olam Haba. We believe, again, the world of Amuna is that life as a body, it's temporary. It's ephemeral. This is not real. This is not the real thing. This is the fake world. This is the world of tests. This is the world of a corridor, as we've talked about in the past. The corridor before the actual world, before the main event. We believe this world of Amuna is that the Sahara, that's that force that's trying to get us, that's trying to get us to pursue our agenda as a body and ignore our agenda as a soul. That's our chief antagonist. That's our chief foe. And that's the force that's trying to make us not see the world of Amuna and instead be duped by the world, the virtual reality world that he tries to portray for us. The world of Amuna tells us that Torah is this guidebook of how to live. And this system, this corpus of Torah is what our soul would do if it wasn't affected by any other forces. We also believe that the Almighty is coordinating and designing a person's specific circumstances to facilitate that person fulfilling their unique mission. The world of Amuna says that every person is different, every person is unique. Every person exists in their own little world. And all the other people that you see in your world, those are the extras, shall we say. Those are the people having their cameos. But you and your life and your decisions really, really matter. You have the ability to influence everything. You have a direct connection with God. Emuna, says the Rambam, faith is not just an isolated checkbox in our world. It's our complete adoption of an entire world view that's different than the world that we're talking about. And one of the things that kick us out of the world of Amuna, envy, lust, and honor. At its core, when someone is envious, they are not viewing themselves as citizens of the world of Amuna. When someone's envious, that is a lack of recognition that the Almighty is guiding my life and giving me everything that I need to fulfill my mission. If I am desirous of what someone else has, I'm envious, I'm jealous of what they have, it seems to imply that the Almighty is not overseeing my life. It's not giving me exactly what I need. It's not tending to me on an individual level, making sure that I get whatever I need. Thus, envy is something that boots a person from the world of Amuna. 
Lust. Lust is pursuit of pleasure. You know, this is a very subtle point. We believe that humans are actually hardwired to seek pleasure. That's the one thing that really everyone is in agreement with. But there's different kinds of pleasure. And that's where we differ. We differ in the fact that we say that there's ultimate pleasure that exists in the world of souls. And that's the real pleasure that we want. And that's the real pleasure that we want. And by the way, all good advice, all self-help, everything is all about saying, hey, let's not exchange short-term, easy, empty calorie pleasures and lose out on the long-term pleasures. Everyone's heard of the idea of delayed gratification. Yes, you could get something easy, cheap now, but if you put in the effort, you work hard, you get something much, much better, much more valuable down the road. The only difference that we have with everyone else is that we say that even the people that are talking about long-term, they're not thinking long-term enough. If you're thinking just about your life in this world, it's still too short-term. You're still focusing too much on the empty calories. We take the perspective, the timeline of eternity. And that's the long-term plan that we have. And we say our entire existence in this world is to try to delay, 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 so to speak, work on the big picture of what's going to be when our soul is finally freed from our body, when it's liberated from the bodily constraints and the bodily incarceration. So yes, we are hardwired to get pleasure. And yes, the goal is pleasure. But the real test is what kind of pleasure we're going to pursue. Is it going to be the physical pleasure, the material pleasure? Any pleasure that is found in this temporary world is still short-term in our minds because only the permanent pleasure is really permanent. And thus everything else is still short-term. So when someone is living a life of lust, they're pursuing as an end goal pleasure in this world, they're not thinking in the same terms, they're not operating the same in the same way as someone living in the world of Amuna. Now, Rabbi Lazar Kapra is quick to tell us, this doesn't mean that you should totally shun, you should totally eschew all forms of worldly pleasure. Don't say, oh, I'm not going to have wine, I'm not going to enjoy this world. No, that's not what he's saying. You should enjoy this world. But there's a difference between making it your goal and making it something to help you get towards your goal. And that's a critical point. Lust, where it's so harmful, where it's so destructive, is when that is the goal. And that's what you're pursuing towards. That's where everything's directing you towards. That's the problem. Ideally, we ought to be focusing towards the ultimate pleasure, namely that of Olam Abba, of a spiritual pleasure, and all the other things are there to facilitate, to enable, to be fueled for the journey, to assist us towards getting that goal. Let's enjoy the steak. But the steak is there to facilitate the Torah, to facilitate the ultimate permanent pleasure. And finally, honor. Honor, the whole notion of someone saying, I am deserving of honor, conflicts with the very basis of the world of Amuna. The world of Amuna acknowledges that God is the sole creator. Everything else is a creation. Angels, animals, the whole world, the galaxies, a human. Everyone is a creation. 
and only a creation, I'm sorry, and only a creator is worthy of honor. A creation is never worthy of honor. And therefore, when someone says, hey, I deserve honor, I deserve plaudits, again, it's obviously not uh, directly, but they are inferring, they are tacitly acknowledging the fact that they're a creator. We believe there's only one creator, it's only God, and thus the pursuit of honor is something that is destabilizing the world of Emuna. The commentaries note that a king, is the person that is most worthy of honor. In fact, the verse even says, you should have an, a king, and you should always have reverence for the king, and therefore, you cannot see the king in a compromising way. You're not allowed to witness a king bathing. You're not allowed to see a king getting a haircut. You have to always have the requisite amount of reverence for a king. Yet, the verse says, that a king must always have a Torah scroll with him at all times. Why? So that he does not lord over his brethren. If the king, the person that, the person that is most worthy of honor is told not to have honor, not to have excessive honor, certainly people like us, simpletons, Lay people should not be pursuing honor. Now, we mentioned earlier that there is a very similar Mishnah in chapter 2, verse Mishnah number 16, that seems to parallel our Mishnah. In that Mishnah, it says, an evil eye, the evil inclination, and hatred of humanity remove a person from the world. So the commentaries explain that these missions are actually paralleling each other. An, even, an evil eye is the ultimate manifestation of envy. An evil inclination is the ultimate manifestation of lust. And hatred for the people, that's what happens when someone pursues honor. What's an evil eye? An evil eye means when you see someone and you seek harm for them. You're envious of them, but you're not sufficient to say, hey, I want what they have. The next level is when someone says, I want them to suffer. I want them to lose. I want them to have less. I want them to falter. So with these missions, they're kind of paralleling each other. Envy, you may say, hey, it's, it's kind of harmless. It's innocuous. A little bit of envy, you're not causing anyone pain. But that could progress. If you don't nip it in the bud, before you know it, the envy has mushroom into an evil eye. Similarly, lust. Yeah, lust, again, seems pretty harmless. Hey, it's only natural. I have some testosterone. And what do you know? It's, it's hormones. I'm a little desirous. I'm not in control so much. Before you know it, that too balloons into an evil inclination, which again, the Talmud says is a foreign god. If you don't stop it, it will get out of control. And hatred of other people, it's a terrible thing. Someone to hate other humans, that's terrible. Where does that start? That starts with the pursuit of honor. When someone pursues honor, and that gets out of hand, and they don't stop it, they don't nip it in the bud, then it's going to inevitably result in hatred of other people. Honor necessarily, the whole concept of honor, necessarily assumes that there is a hierarchy of humans. And when someone wants honor, they want to be, you know, higher up on this human hierarchy. And the second they allow that to fester, they start looking down at their competitors. Hey, there's only one person atop this hierarchy. There's only one person who is the king of the mountain who's on the very top of the totem pole. And then for every other person, 
well, those are my competitors. And ultimately, people who are pursuing honor become people that hate others. And I think these two missions are essentially telling us that envy, lust, and honor doesn't stop there. It progresses until it gets to levels that people didn't necessarily imagine were possible at the very beginning. And we could see how could someone be removed from the world. People could, could get so bitter, so cantankerous, so consumed with their own desire of lust, so hedonistic, that really it's easy to see how someone like that is out of the world. But it starts off small, and it grows and it grows until it metastasizes, and the envy, but the lie, the lust becomes an evil inclination, and the pursuit of honor becomes hatred of other people. And our mission is encouraging us, let's try to stop this before it gets out of hand, because these are very harmful and very destructive. I want to conclude with a theory that I developed a couple of years ago. I'm very proud of this theory. So you let me know if, if you like it as well. As always, my email address is rabbitwobergym.com. Let me know if you like it. If you don't like it, let me know as well. So the Mishnah tells us that envy, lust, honor, remove a person from the world. It's not so clear what the mechanism here is. What does it mean? A person is envious? Okay, they're not in the world. Again, like we mentioned earlier, the world is not identified which world it is. But what happens when someone has envy that contributes to them being removed from the world? So here's the thing I want to suggest. Tell me if you like it. There's a very critical teaching in the Talmud, in the book of Tainus, page 11a. This is one of the founding central teachings relative to the whole question of all about, to the whole question of reward and punishment. Of course, we believe someone does a mitzvah, someone fulfills the will of God, they get reward. Someone does a sin, they disobey the will of God, well, they get punishment. Very central belief. You read the Torah, it's clear. Torah again and again reiterates the point, you do good, you get good, you do bad, you get bad. But how and where and under what circumstances are the reward and punishment dispensed, that's more of a mystery. So here in this Talmud, it does give a little bit of structure to divine reward and punishment. And it tells us like this. It tells us that the degree of mitzvah, the degree of sin, doesn't matter. If you do the smallest mitzvah, reward is coming your way. If you do the smallest sin, punishment's coming your way. Now, it might be more reward. Now, it might be uh, less reward than a big mitzvah, and it might be less punishment than a big sin. But it doesn't matter how large it is, however large or small it is, it's going to trigger this divine process, this divine reward and punishment. However, this is the critical point. Says the Talmud, it matters how a person is in aggregate. Meaning, if a person is righteous, then their reward and punishment regime is going to be different than if a person is wicked. How so? So here's what the Talmud says. A righteous person is punished in this world and rewarded in Olam Abba. A wicked person is the opposite, is rewarded in this world and is punished in Olam Abba. So we have this world, the physical world. We have Olam Abba, the spiritual world. Someone has a mitzvah, they get rewarded. 
are they going to be rewarded in the physical world or the spiritual world? It's not so clear. Some of this is sin. They get punished. Are they are punished here or are they punished there? It's not so clear. Says the Talmud, I'll clarify it for you. If you're righteous, if you're a tzaddik in general, well, you do a mitzvah, you get rewarded in the spiritual world. What if you do a sin? Well, if you do a sin, you get punished in the physical world. A spiritual person gets spiritual reward and physical punishment. A physical person, i.e. someone who's wicked, gets physical reward and spiritual punishment. That's what the Talmud says in the book of Titus, page 11a. Now, the way the Talmud frames this is as follows. I know there's a lot of moving parts here, but we'll hopefully it'll make sense. It says the Talmud, quotes a verse in Deuteronomy. The verse says that God is fair, God is just, and God is not unjust, not unfair. There's no iniquity in God. And therefore, because God is fair, God will reward even the wicked if they do a mitzvah. And God will punish even the righteous if they do a sin. God's fair. There's no, as we say in Yiddish, protexia. You don't have the ability to say, hey, I'm righteous. Why don't you just ignore these sins? Or if someone is wicked, you don't say, hey, you're wicked. And therefore, you don't get the reward from these mitzvahs. Now God is fair. And therefore, everyone, no matter how righteous or wicked, has the same treatment of God, they get rewarded for mitzvahs and they get punished for sins. That's the Talmud. There is the question. The entire premise of this Talmud, again, the Talmud, Talmud is trying to figure out how does God reward and punish? How does God reward and punish? The entire premise of the Talmud is that the system that the Almighty has is fair. It's just. It's righteous. It's not unfair. Yet seemingly, if you look at the system, it seems to be quite unfair, quite unjust, quite inequitable. Why? You have a righteous person and a wicked person. And they both do the identical mitzvah. Identical. And again, the Almighty judges it as being the same. The motivation was the same. The, the dedication was the same. Their intention was the same. The actual mitzvah was the same. Completely identical. Talmud tells us that the righteous is rewarded in the spiritual world for that mitzvah. The wicked is rewarded in this world for that mitzvah. And the Talmud is saying this is the manifestation of fairness. The Almighty is so, so fair with everyone. But it's not fair. The same mitzvah will yield different results for the tzaddik, for the righteous person. They'll get reward for that mitzvah in Olam Aban, spiritual world, which we know is a world of much greater pleasure. And the wicked person for the identical mitzvah will have their reward exhausted in this world. It's not fair. And the whole premise of the Talmud is that the money is fair. And it describes a completely holy, unfair system. Thus, the Talmud really is in need of an explanation. So here's my suggestion. The Almighty is fair. And every mitzvah, no matter how small, is rewarded. And every sin, no matter how small, is punished. And no matter how wicked a person is, if they do a mitzvah, they get rewarded. And no matter how righteous a person is, if they do a sin, they get punished. Completely fair. But the Almighty's fairness extends to such a degree that the Almighty says, I'm going to allow you to choose in which world you want to be rewarded for your mitzvah. Not only is the Almighty saying, I'm going to reward you for every mitzvah. Fair. And I'm going to punish you for every sin. Fair. Fair system. I'm going to allow you to choose which world you value and thus which world you want to be rewarded in and which world you devalue, you deprioritize and want to get punished in. And therefore, the tzaddik 
implicitly says, the righteous person says, I want the spiritual world. And that's what I value. And you know what I devalue relative to that is this world. And therefore, implicitly, the tzaddik is saying, reward me in all my bar, punish me here. Conversely, the rasha is saying, I value this world. And I devalue, I deprioritize the next world. And therefore, he is implicitly telling God, I want to be rewarded here and punished there. So the system is fair. It's fair because the Almighty rewards and punishes and also allows a person to choose which world you value and want to be rewarded in and which world you devalue and want to be punished in. So let's look at our mission again. There's three things that remove a person from the world. I want to suggest that these three things are three characteristics that demonstrate prioritization of this world. And consequently, when a person has envy, lust, and honor, they are in effect lobbying God, petitioning God, telling God, please reward me here. And please don't hold the reward for all of us. The person is envious. And again, like we said earlier, if you're envious of someone's spirituality, that's, that's a good thing. That's not what's being described in their mission. You're envious for someone's physical and material goodness. That's what you want. Envy, by definition, is someone saying, I crave and cherish and covet this world. And thus, it's telling God, reward me here. When someone is lustful, that in effect is a vote of a man, of a person, to say, I value pleasure in this world. And thus, it's telling God, reward me here, in this world. Honor. Honor is someone saying, I did something good. Give me plaudits here. Honor me for it here. Thus, all these three characteristics are a person telling God, in your fairness, you treat me fairly, and you reward me and punish me, and I want my reward here. And that's when someone exhibits lust and envy and honor, they're in effect telling God, reward me here to the detriment, to the exclusion of all of my And that's when someone is envious, lustful, and seeking honor, in effect, they're going to be kicked out. They're going to be removed from the world, from the spiritual world, because all their reward is going to be given to them, delivered to them here in this world. And sadly, they will have no reward left once they arrive at the next world. I thought that was a very clever way to frame the mechanism of how a person gets booted from Olam Abba because of these three things. Because these three things are a person telling God, hey, reward me here and not there. And that is something that the Almighty says, you know what? I'm fair. I'm going to allow you to choose which world you want to prioritize. So that's his teaching of the Mishnah. It's a very short teaching, and there's a lot of meaning to it. These three things are things that, you know, we, we are familiar with that. Envy, it's something that we have, to, we have to combat it. We have to say, hey, we live in a world of a moon, and the Almighty's taking care of us. I have to say, you know what? The Almighty is delivering to me exactly what I need. And he's not giving me what I don't need. And thus, I'm happy with what I have. And it's a great virtue. Of course, lust is something that we all are predisposed to. Child, every day they're born, they want pleasure. But as we mature, we're supposed to mature as well and say, you know what? Not all pleasures are created equal. Let's try to pursue the more lasting pleasures. And ultimately, the ultimate pleasure that really matters is the pleasure that lasts forever. And that's not to say that we have to live a monastic lifestyle and deprive ourselves of everything. No, if someone deprives themselves of wine, they're a sinner. But there is a fine balance between enjoying life and now making it a priority. And finally, honor. If you want honor, you are saying that you're a creator and you're negating God and you're going to come to actually hate other people. And that's something to be very careful of. And thus, the great virtue of humility is to be adopted. Very powerful and 
I think, insightful Mishnah. And the lessons for us are clear. Let's try to be happy with what we have. And let's, and let's try to live a life of focusing to try to have as much of a, a spiritual agenda as possible and let's live a life of humility. Thus, we can ensure that we will not be removed, not from this world and not from the next world. My email address is rabbiwalbajim.com. I look forward to hearing from emails, questions, comments, and feedback of all types.